Welcome to our podcast, Jack Edge, Updates in Atrial Fibrillation. This is your host, Pratik Doshi. I currently serve as the editor of the Jack Edge Monthly Newsletter, where we do deep dives into hot topics in cardiology. We're lucky to be joined today by Dr. Ratika Prakash, an electrophysiologist at Dalhousie University, a long-standing member of the AFib Committee in Canada, and a current member of the Jack EP Editorial Board. Dr. Prakash completed medical school at Daily House as well, followed by internal medicine and cardiology fellowship at the University of Ottawa and, and electrophysiology fellowship at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's such a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I know that our time is limited and I want to really get into, get into the meat and bones because there's a lot to talk about with AFib, especially with the new guidelines mm-hmm. being published in November of 2023. Um, so I think that one of the big questions that I have, at least, you know, as a trainee and I've heard from other people and other colleagues is how do we think about risk factor modification in patients who might develop AFib? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And risk factor modification has changed tremendously. You know, when I started tr- my training back, you know, 20 years ago, atrial fibrillation was basically, there was not much we could do. Mm-hmm. You know, there was not, not many treatments other than antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, which were not working well in a blatant pace was, was a way to treat atrial fibrillation at that time. We've learned so much in the last two decades. Uh, there, the group in Adelaide has done a tremendous amount of work in risk factor modification. I have a trial running in risk factor modification currently to see if we can do good upstream therapy in mm. patients who have atrial fibrillation to prevent it uh, and get better outcomes after catheter ablation. And and so risk factor modification, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. One is really upstream. Mm. So in people who have risk factors for development of atrial fibrillation, like hypertension, uh, like diabetes, like uh, large left atria, you know, there's lots of reasons to, to that you could develop atrial fibrillation and starting very early in treating risk factors at that point in time. And then there is, of course, the, the next step, which is you've already had atrial fibrillation and what can you do there? And, and there's good cohort data, even some ran, one randomized trial that has looked at obesity in patients with atrial fibrillation and that weight loss reduces symptoms as well as burden uh, with, with when it was checked with Holter monitoring in that particular study. And so, uh, you know, these studies are very difficult to do. Trust me, I'm doing one. It's, it's a very challenging area to try to make people change their behaviors yeah. um, and to lose weight. Uh, but so far, our intervention's working, which is, uh, you know, one of the issues that has happened in many of the randomized trials when you look at risk factor modification. For example, there was a study looking at uh, obesity uh, and weight loss, and they didn't lose any weight. So, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, so, you know, if you can make it happen, make it work. We The cohort data is very supportive that you are going to modify the substrate that, that causes atrial fibrillation. So you know, sleep apnea, hypertension, uh, alcohol is a huge, uh, you know, issue in North America. Um, uh, weight loss, physical activity—all mm-hmm. of these things are critical. So, you know, I, obviously, all of these things are modifiable risk factors that we talk about. And, like you said, behavior change is very, very hard to do, even in a controlled, you know, randomized setting. Absolutely. So, maybe in the clinical trial front, how do you, how are you able to encourage behavior change, and how how do we apply that then to clinical? Yeah. Practice. No, that's a, that's a, that's that is the key, yeah. right? <laughs> so that is the key, and and so in the trial, what we have is we've made it as easy as possible. So we're using a home-based exercise uh, model that was developed at the University of Ottawa uh, that is applied for patients post MI. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so uh, we p- applied it now to AFib patients, and you know we have over eighty percent compliance to all of the follow-ups. We have um, weight loss is is as high as you know. 6%, which is actually hard to achieve yeah. without a Zempic. So, you know, <laughs> there is some Zempic use, but, uh, but, you know, so that's a, but that's a very controlled environment. But the, once we can prove that this is necessary at that time frame prior to, you, you know, doing something really aggressive, like an ablation, mm-hmm. um, we can then figure out what's the best way to apply it. You know, we're now in the area of the era of digital health, virtual care. I mean, I think these are really optimal ways that people can work on these things at home yeah. and not have to go outside and spend a whole bunch of money. You know, physical activity is a great way for, to achieve weight loss and it's easy to do. So, you know, it's uh, yeah. 
that yeah. would be my two cents on, on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. I know this is not something we initially were going to discuss, but on the topic of digital health and you know devices, have you felt in your practice that the growth of you know wearable technologies like you know heart rate monitors and AFib detectors is making it easier for patients to realize they have AFib earlier on, or do you feel like it's yeah. becoming more of a detriment? No, I don't. You know, uh, we thought that. You know, mm -hmm. so when the Apple Watch came out, and you know, we had the Apple Watch study, and and we saw all these people monitoring their heart rate, and we thought it was going to be a deluge of people coming in with with AFib and seeing this. And there is a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Now that it, the these monitors are, are widespread and, and easy to use, no question. And you have to be very very careful in interpreting the the Apple Watch uh, tachograms, but. Um, you know, I think that it has allowed us to diagnose people earlier, get on top of it earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that treating atrial fibrillation early is a benefit, mm -hmm. you know, in reducing cardiovascular events. The East AF study showed us that. Um, and, and so uh, I think that it's a good thing. Um, you know, as uh, cardiologists, we're going to have to learn to, to get on the, the train with risk factor modification early um, and then learning how to use rhythm control potentially early to try and prevent uh, long-term out adverse outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, sometimes with too much information, it obviously becomes hard for you as a clinician to manage, but also the patient to kind of really interpret. Well, absolutely. And patients do have trouble with, with wearable technology because they over-interpret, mm -hmm. right? And then and then they think they're going to die with, with, their, <laughs> with their, you know, when their heart rate's elevated. But it also allows allows monitoring to be done more easily. I think the Cardia Mobile, for example, is a great way to monitor patients who have atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. It gives them peace of mind, especially if, if, if they have early feedback. Like So yeah. that's the other part of it, is how do we manage uh, in, in providing that early feedback to the patient without burning ourselves out by <laughs> exactly. you know, all of this information coming back to us. So, so you know, things like AI and machine learning are going to be able to help us. You know, manage that volume of information that we're going to see with uh, with wearable technology. Absolutely. I think the future of AFib is going to be really exciting. Yeah. But speaking of, you know, all these innovations and changes that have been made, there was new guidelines that we talked about published in November of 2023. What do you think is, you know, if you had to give me a couple of takeaways for our audience, what, what are the big things you want us to know about AFib management today? Yeah. So I think, you know, number one, we already talked about risk factor modification was, was a big take home message in, in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. It's now part of the pillars of, of AF treatment. Uh, number two, uh, you, changes with respect to rhythm control, particularly in atrial fibrillation with uh, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. I think, you know, now it's moved from a class two recommendation to a class one recommendation mm -hmm. based on the data. Uh, we did a trial in Canada as well, and, and our trial was, was borderline positive. We needed a couple more events to, to get there. Uh, but, um, you know, I think in patients who are suitable for either rate or rhythm control and their ejection fraction is reduced, rhythm control with yeah. catheter ablation is the way to go. That's another uh, big take home message. Uh, you know, and the other thing that was interesting about the guidelines is, is there's still a lot of work yeah. to be done. Right. So there's still a lot of work to be done. But I think that if, if anything, in terms of changing practice, I think we have to get onto the risk factor boat. And then we've got to recommend patients for rhythm control when they present early. So that's another major uh, part of the guideline that came out that was different from, from previous. Uh, you know, we've never really had... Um, any studies that have showed us that rhythm control does anything major, yeah. right? I mean, you know, we have the old trials of FIRM and RACE and, and all of these trials did not show benefit. Yeah. But now in our area with catheter ablation, using drugs more safely, we are showing benefit. Absolutely. One of the things I struggle with when I talk to patients about AFib and, and ablation in general is the fact that ablation is an invasive procedure and, you know, sometimes is obviously scarier than taking a drug like amiodarone every yeah. single day. Yeah. So how do you manage that type of conversation yeah, with no, patients? Yeah, that's, that's excellent. And that's exactly the issue, right? Yeah. And I have lots of patients that uh, that say, you know, I'd rather the pill. I don't want the risk of stroke. I don't want the risk of cardiac proliferation. I'm scared. Um, you know, and atrial esophageal yeah. fistulas are, are real. I mean, they're rare, but they're real. And, and so now we're moving into an era of ablation that is using technologies that are more cardioselective. Mm -hmm. So you've heard of probably pulse field ablation. Um, this is this plus even thermal technologies mm -hmm. are uh, becoming safer, uh, lower risk, faster. Um, you know, procedures can be done. You know, they don't no longer take three to four hours. We're looking at you know a couple of hours to get these procedures done. 
but they're still major procedures. They still have the potential for risks. And so we have to have those discussions with our patients. You know, amiodarone long term, not the greatest thing either, yeah, <laughs> right? Absolutely. It has its own problems. <laughs> and and so so it's it's short term risk with a procedure with long term gain versus uh, long term risk with probably going to fail, yeah, <laughs> you know, at some point, exactly. you know, so I think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of ablation, but also I don't force patients mm-hmm. into a procedure if they don't want to. Sometimes they need that time to, you know, maybe experience a side effect from the drug um, or have recurrent atrial fibrillation mm-hmm. to understand that, that, okay, that's the way to go. And, and, and so I, I would never push a procedure on a patient who, who isn't interested because it's just not in their best interest. Um, so shared decision-making, and and making them understand so as long as they can get a good grasp of what the risks and benefits of their choices are Mm -hmm. that's the way to really approach it yeah i think that's a really important point where we need to have the we need to have a very open and frank conversation with patients at the same time you know maybe explaining to them the data in a way that makes sense to them and i think you know sometimes as clinicians we can often you know do a great part of explaining like the risks but maybe not so much under helping them understand you know, if you don't do this, this is what the, yeah, like exactly. the next five or 10 years are going to look like. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So going back to the guidelines and kind of the tools that we use on a day-to-day basis, uh, one of the big things that we're taught, you know, in med school and in residency is the chads VAS score. Yes. Yes. Uh, obviously a imperfect tool yes. to understand anticoagulation in patients. So I know that with the new guidelines, there's been changes and developments in how we think about anticoagulation in those patients. Do you do you mind walking us through that a little bit? Yeah. So you know the the guidelines um, are, are they're interesting. You know they, they, there's a class one recommendation for a Chad's VASC of two uh, or more in 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 a in, in a woman. Uh, sorry, in a man and three or more in a woman. Uh, and then a class two recommendation for um, uh, a Chaz vas score between at, at one mm-hmm. and for, for a man and two for a woman. And so, you know, they've kind of put some cut points on, on risk. So it's reasonable to consider anticoagulation with that Chaz vas. But they've also expanded the section to include other factors that might influence your decision uh, to actually anticoagulate. For example, the burden of atrial fibrillation. So we're learning a lot about burden. You know, we're in the area, again, of continuous monitoring monitoring with devices. Yeah. You know, Artesia and NOAA just came out. They've taught us a lot about burden um, and how that impacts your risk of atrial fibrillation. And so, uh, you know, if somebody is in persistent atrial fibrillation and they're borderline for a uh, risk factor, you may err on the side of caution, you know, and actually anticoagulating them. Um, the, the move to anticoagulate everybody who's undergone a cardioversion irrespective of age, mm-hmm. you know, that's another, uh, you, you know, that's a vulnerable period, right, uh, for, for patients. Yeah. Larger left atria, um, uh, you know, borderline hypertension. Uh, even, you know, they say that even um, a blood pressure, one elevated blood pressure value is enough to increase your risk of st- from stroke, right, from atrial fibrillation. I mean, that's crazy. But, it, but it's true because, you know, the thing is, as physicians, we see a patient for 15 minutes or maybe 35 minutes if you yeah. have more time, you know. And, but that's a snapshot of what's going on with them exactly. at home, right? So we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg. So if we see hypertension in the office that's real and it's not white coat, mm-hmm. I mean, their blood pressures are likely high all the time, you know. So, uh, you know, this is this is the the interesting uh, part of of, uh, of anticoagulation. And now, as we have safer and safer anticoagulants uh, with lower bleeding risk, and still more to come in that area, they're doing studies using, you know, the, the novel agents uh, that might they're purported to have lower bleeding risk. Mm-hmm. We'll see. One study came out; it was stopped early because it wasn't. Um, but uh, but we'll we'll see where where that goes. Uh, I mean, our threshold to anticoagulate has just changed dramatically. The warfarin days are over. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is a great thing for patients, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my grandpa was on warfarin and having to go every two weeks and, you know, yeah, check. It's, brutal. I, it's, yeah. it's awful. It's, yeah. It's tough. So. Yeah. Not, not that warfarin, you know, doesn't have its place. Probably. Oh, it absolutely does. It's yeah. critical, actually, in rheumatic heart disease, of course, and valves. Uh, but, but also, I mean, patients with renal failure, in, in some ways, you know, if, if you do choose to anticoagulate, I mean, again, the renal failure um, uh, situation in dialysis patients, it, it's controversial whether you anticoagulate at all. But, um, uh, you, you know, the, there are, it is a required medication. And, you know, I saw people who have left atrial thrombus on, on DOACs, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, 
because the DOACs, if you forget a dose, you're not anticoagulated. No. So, you, so you have to be careful. Uh, but but anyway, back to the, the, the um, uh, you know, sh shifting the pendulum, I, I think it is an important conversation, uh, irrespective of whether you fit into the CHADS VASC um, criteria or not with respect to anticoagulation in patients with AF. Is, do you envision a new scoring system or coming out? Or do you think that the, the chaz vast is what we're stuck with for right now? I think until we learn more about what uh, causes that clot to form in the mm -hmm. left atrial appendage or, um, you know, understand more about bi maybe biomarkers um, that uh, predict uh, clot formation uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation, we're kind of stuck with, with the chaz vast. I don't see it changing. It's, it's, um, uh, but but those those times are here, right? Yeah, so absolutely. so I think you know potentially um, in the next decade we'll be plugging people's uh, information into a, an AI system and it's going <laughs> to spit something out for us, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think that brings up a good point. So what does the future of AFib research look like? Oh yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that we still need to understand. Uh, we need to understand atrial uh, progression. Um, we know that atrial fibrillation is a progressive uh, disease. Um, we've made it into a disease. It may not actually be a disease. It may be a marker of many, many other things that are going on in in uh, in the milieu of the heart. And mm -hmm. the atrium is the the barometer of everything bad happening to somebody. Um, it's it's rare that it's a pure electrical problem, and it, it can be. Uh, you know, we've had AFib in 17 year olds, right? And yeah, there's not much true. wrong with them uh, usually. Um, so uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's you, there's a lot to learn uh, from that point of view. Uh, with respect to trying to predict uh, thromboembolic events better. Mm -hmm. I think that's still an area of study. Um, and then uh, advances in medications. Absolutely. No, I think that's all fantastic. And it really shows us that even though it feels like we know a lot and this is a disease that we've been treating for a long time, sometimes with old drugs and sometimes with new, there's still a lot to learn and a lot of development yeah. happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Prakash, thank you so much for your time. It's such a pleasure speaking to you and learning from you. For all of uh, those at home who want to learn more about AFib as well as other hot topics in cardiology, please subscribe to the Jack Edge newsletter. And for our listeners, this is your host, Pratik Doshi, and we hope to catch you next time on the Jack Edge podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much.